Hey y'all, this is the lecture for chapter 10, which is on group therapy for the treatment of addictive use disorders. This is kind of a short chapter, but it's really important. Um, also know that in your group counseling class, you will get even more um, in-depth and much more thorough information on group counseling in general. This chapter is really just gonna touch on what it's like um, to conduct group counseling with addictive use disorders. This. Sorry. Um, okay, so what we know is that predominantly treatment centers, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, and oftentimes even some private practice settings, use group counseling more often and more commonly than they do individual counseling. Um, why is that? Well, it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, so I can deliver a bunch of information to many individuals as opposed to an hour at a time with one individual client. You can kind of see how you can reach more people in a group setting than you can in an individual setting. Um, there are a variety of ways that uh, sort of this can play out. So, you know, in a nutshell, group counseling is this um, interpersonal approach of communicating and learning things and expressing emotions or processing emotions and feelings that can hopefully lead toward behavioral changes, emotional changes, etc. So the goal is to, to have a group experience that supports and fosters that change process. Um, that can be done through uh, psychoeducation. We'll talk about these briefly, but psychoeducational groups, therapeutic groups, or support groups. Why does group counseling work? And why do we use group counseling? Um, the, the, the main tenant is to normalize experiences or even diagnoses in individuals. So the idea, this, the sense of universality, I am not alone. I am in a room with other individuals who struggle with the same diagnosis or who struggle with the same set of symptoms or struggle with the same sort of behavioral issues and concerns or emotional issues and concerns as me. And um, that the whole group members uh, collectively are sort of working toward this change process together, although that change looks different individually, um, they're working through this together. Uh, the level of empathy and support, of course, this next bullet point um, multiplies. So when it's just an individual session, one-on-one, -on -one, a counselor and a client in a room, empathy, empathy and support is, uh, you know, coming from sort of one side. When you're in a room with a lot of people, especially people who really truly understand what's going on with you, the client, um, or then, then they can sort of offer that empathy and support in, in, in multiple ways and, and uh, a, a, again, multiplied by the number of people in that group. Um, there is also that aspect of learning that can happen in a group setting. Um, learning through either the facilitator providing some education, a group member providing education, or even just through group members and the facilitators modeling new behaviors or emotions that again foster and support that change. Um, what's really neat about group work and this, this um, this bullet point here, group cohesiveness. But what's really neat about that is sort of the collective goal of change and progress. Everyone is attending this group um, together, collectively, around the same issue and topic. Um, oftentimes, um, group counseling is utilized, like I said, in treatment centers, but it's often utilized by folks who um, are mandated to counseling. And so that can be a little bit tricky because you've got different motivational reasons for being for the clients being there. And so as a facilitator, you may have to navigate these different stages of change. We just talked about this in that last chapter that each of those individual group members may be in. Um, and then the focus of group can be either preventative or remedial, and remedial addresses those unhealthy behaviors. So it's learning about unhealthy behaviors, learning how to identify when they happen, 
and, um, and, and exploring even negative consequences. And preventative is let's stop it before we get there. Um, sorry about this. I keep forgetting to take that off, <laughs> the transitions off. Um, why is group counseling good for addiction? Again, going back to that concept of universality. Um, it's a positive and a negative. This is sort of a positive and a negative aspect of individuals with addictive uh, use disorders in that they feel terminally unique. No one understands my experience like I do. And so if you have a group of individuals who also similarly experience this addictive use disorder behavior, symptoms, emotions, consequences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have many more opportunities for process to occur. You have many more opportunities for this fluid exchange of information that is around one similar struggle, one similar consequence. And so it can normalize some of the things that an individual with an addictive use disorder may be feeling. It can normalize some of the experiences that they've had, and it can normalize and break down some of the stigmas that may be associated with addictive use disorders that maybe a client may have. Um, you can see here, uh, promoting social skill development, promotes self-disclosure. So um, it, it supports the idea that a client needs to go a little bit further because maybe they see other group members doing this as well. And then, of course, that supportive nature of assisting each other. And that assistance can be with kind responses and supportive statements, but it can also be somewhat confrontational or challenging at times. You as the facilitator uh, have to navigate those confrontations and make sure that they are always stay healthy, even though they may be a little heated, they do need to always stay healthy. But that's sort of a huge benefit, particularly when it comes to addictive use disorders. We know that a hallmark of all addiction and all addictive use disorders is denial. And so when you have a room full of people ready to sort of challenge you on that, um, just think about sort of the opportunity for growth and change. Um, it doesn't necessarily always work that way the first time for clients, but when they start hearing other people who have similar and like experiences, um, then, then it sort of like plants that seed. I think what's also crucial about utilizing a group counseling for addictive use disorders is the concept 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 of self-disclosure in addictive use disorders. Um, so generally, as a counsel counseling profession, we tend to not disclose personal information about our personal information about ourselves as counselors. Um, we tend to err on the side of disclosing only, 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 only when it benefits the client, when it involves consultation and supervision around the why and the how of the disclosure, and when it is never going to take the focus off of the client. And so, like we discussed in the, the um, chapter on professional issues with in addictive use disorders, Many counselors working in addiction may have also recovery experience. And so if you start sharing your recovery experience, you've put the onus and the focus on you. And you're talking about your experience in recovery. And I, I just kind of want to put this question out there for you all to think about. Can your experience with any situation ever be just like someone else's. And so remembering that our relationship with our client, as a counselor, our relationship with a client should be vastly and totally different than the relationships that they have with other people outside of, uh, outside of that counseling room. And so a group experience allows for others to, it, to disclose personal issues with addictive use disorders without sort of the focus being just solely on, on the counselor and the client. I hope that makes sense. The way that I sort of thought about that in my head, um, I'm hoping that it wasn't, um, I'm hoping that it was clear. Uh, let's see. Okay, purposes of group. Again, remedial or preventative. We, do we want to challenge some of these behaviors that you've already seen and you've experienced? That might be the purpose. Preventative being um, we want to get to 
these behaviors, excuse me, uh, do we want to get to these behaviors before they start and make sure that you are addressing triggers and cravings? Those would be examples of preventative. Um, I, I like, um, sorry, I didn't go down far enough. This uh, experiment with new behaviors in a safe setting, that's what we talked about a little bit earlier, being able to provide an opportunity to clients to see behaviors and emotions being expressed in a different way. So clients have an opportunity uh, to see how new things can be modeled and how change can occur. And then of course, this last bullet point again, receiving feedback. It's another opportunity for the client who struggles with an addictive use disorder to re receive feedback from others and specifically others who have struggled and been through a very similar, always never exactly alike, but similar experiences they. And it does so in a safe space because um, it, 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 it is in that group environment. So that aspect and air of support is always and should be there. Psychoeducational groups, these are teaching type groups. You're educating members on a topic. Maybe you're educating members on what triggers are, what cravings look like and feel like. Maybe you're educating members on impulse control. Maybe you're educating members on um, uh, safety plans. Um, you know, I would do some education, psychoeducational groups regularly around the holidays on creating safety plans for their holiday experience. So whatever their holiday experience may be, um, we would do some psychoeducational groups about how to set up the healthiest experience without possibly relapsing. Um, understanding, so you get it's educational. You get under, you get a clarity. You you are you are taught uh, aspects of, of different components that may support recovery. Um, again, you know, here's here's just some ideas, information about addiction. Maybe you're doing an info, maybe you're doing a psychoeducational group on um, withdrawal. What does withdrawal look like? Um, what does tolerance look like? Or maybe you might do one on substances. Um, and then there's a couple of other examples of, of, of different types of, of learning that can occur. Psychotherapeutic groups, these are processing groups. These are uh, used to help gain insight. These, are, these groups are, let's talk about grief. I think um, grief is an example on here. Let's talk about grief. Let's talk about your grief as it relates to losing the substance that you have had a very close relationship on for so very long. Long. It can be group on losing the people who you have lost in your life, either because they don't want to be around you anymore because of your substance use or because maybe um, they have passed away, some related to substance use. Um, and then, you know, you see here processing painful emotions, processing family of origin issues. These are processed therapeutic groups. These look very different than educational groups in that in an educational group, the facilitator is doing the majority of the talking. Process groups, you're presenting it and then you're helping them explore and process these different concepts. Um, effectiveness of group. So, um, you know, like I, I started this off by saying that um, it's the most widely and commonly used approach for addictive use disorders. However, um, we know that uh, you know, uh, psychoeducational groups do show some better outcomes because they're teaching someone something. It's hard to sort of assess psychotherapeutic groups uh, because everyone's different and these are usually self-report measures. Um, we know that preventative psychoeducational groups, i.e. DARE, are 100% essentially ineffective. If you if you are teaching a group that says do not do substances, you're not really going to get across to people. Um, and there's a lot of research on that that's pretty interesting. Um, coupled, this is important, coupled with individual counseling uh, increases the effectiveness of group. So we kind of want to do all of these together. Self-help groups, we'll talk a lot about that at AA and 12-step when we talk about AA and 12-step, but self-help groups are not led by counselors. These are led by other supportive members. Um, and that's about it. Uh, 